The scripture today comes from Matthew chapter 5, verse 4 of the New International Version. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The summer I turned 14, my dad died suddenly. My mom went to wake him up from a nap, but he had died in his sleep. We lived in the Bronx, but we always spent our summers in upstate New York, tucked away amidst lakes and dairy farms and mountains. It was 45 minutes to the nearest hospital. I remember riding in the back of the ambulance through the dark night of the countryside, just surreal. I sat in a metal chair next to the open door of a phone booth outside of the waiting room as my mom called each of my siblings to tell them that dad was gone. I heard the story get told over and over again. And yet the next day when we had driven back to the city, I didn't know how to pick up the phone, how to call my friends. It seemed too sad of a story to tell my middle school friends. I thought it would scare them, this possibility of death. I didn't want them to hurt for me or to feel bad that they wouldn't know what to say or to do. It would have been much easier if I'd have been able to post something on Instagram or send out a text message if only that had been available some way to send up a flag that I needed them. They didn't live nearby or go to the same church and the start of school was still weeks away. Have you ever been hurting or grieving or in pain and you just don't know how to put it into words? You don't know how to invite someone else in. You don't even know what you need, really. It just aches. I come from a big family, so in the days that followed, there was a constant stream of people in and out of our house. I was never alone, but my people still didn't know. On the second night of the visitation at the funeral home, Dave Slattery walked in. Slats, we called him. He was the eighth grade dean. Big Irish Catholic man who uh, loved to crack jokes over the microphone in the cafeteria or sneak up behind misbehaving students and blow his whistle and put them on the ledge for the rest of the lunch period. I can still see him standing in the doorway, that plaid cap on his head and, and a sad smile on his face. He had read dad's obituary in the paper and he showed up just for me. Sometimes it's the people you least expect who in what seemed to be the smallest of ways bring comfort that still feels like a balm to your soul over 40 years later. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Many in the crowd on the mountain who heard Jesus speak these words needed a balm for their soul. They had much to mourn. Many of them had been bringing their sick to Jesus. They lived in desperate circumstances, pushed to the margins of life. They say that much of the power of the Beatitudes depends on where you're sitting when you hear them. Some thought their place of honor in the temple made them closer to God. But Jesus says to them, don't think you've got God all figured out and wrapped neatly in a box. On the other hand, those who think you're invisible, those whom the world says don't really count for much, to these Jesus flips the script and says, you are blessed. God sees you. God values you. You are nearer to God than you know right now. Blessed are those who mourn, 
for they will be comforted. It's been a hard couple of weeks in the life of First Baptist. There have been many deaths in our congregation, many saints who have shaped us to be who we are today as a church. And there has been mourning, for their loss is felt deeply. And there has been God's promise of comfort that has come in so many ways. The comfort of friends and family who share our loss, who tell our stories. The presence of those who weep with us, a reminder of God's presence in our midst. Many a casserole has been baked and delivered in these weeks, and we joke about that sometimes, but God's hospitality and grace is often delivered to us in disposable aluminum pans. Tangible comfort in the midst of grief. Sometimes comfort comes in a new perspective, a renewed commitment to honoring God with the life he's given us, the life we are still living. In our remembrances of those who passed away recently, we spoke of their smiles and their energy and their care for those in need. And I don't know about you, but it always stirs in me the desire to be better, to give more of myself, that it may be said of me as it was declared of them, she walked with God. Life is too short to squander my days with things that ultimately do not matter. And it gives me great comfort to know that God's mercies are new every morning, that God is making all things new, even you and even me. Most especially in our mourning, there is the comfort of our faith. As Christians, we grieve, but not as those who have no hope. Even when death is unexpected, even when life ends more abruptly than we think it has a right to, even when our faith is shaken to its core, our hope is anchored in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God knows our grief, and he grieves with us in our pain, the pain of a father who saw the death of his own son on a cross that we might never be separated from the comfort of the presence of God. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus says. Those who believe in me, though they die, yet shall they live. Death is not the end, we are promised. My mother was a woman of great faith. <laughs> she had been married twice and she lost her first husband to cancer and then lost my dad. And as she herself lay dying in the hospital, she talked in vivid detail about how both of them were there with her. Bill was fixing a car and Ed was making a sandwich. The ordinary holy moments of life. And Flo was there too, her sister-in-law and closest friend who had died years before. Mom said that Flo had come to take her home. Maybe you have stories like that as well. They are a gift of grace. It's a mystery, this thin veil that separates life and death, heaven and earth. And it is holy ground filled with the nearness of God. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. You know, it's not just in the death of a person that we mourn. Illness comes and we mourn the future we thought would be and now will be different. College students hoped the fall would bring back a sense of normal to life, but little is what they expected, what they prepared for, what they wanted. We mourn the loss of relationships, of jobs, of abilities and opportunities. Losses that force us to wrestle with the life we imagine and the life we have. Frank Hawkins, 
a very wise minister, once told me that grief is cumulative. When one loss follows another, he said, the grief of the first one doesn't end when the next one begins. They layer on top of one another. They are heavier together. The layers are many these days, aren't they? It can be overwhelming. And our losses can take us in one of two directions. We can be frustrated and angry and bitter. And make no mistake, God can handle all of those emotions. But they will not bring us the comfort we long for. The peace that passes understanding, the calm in the midst of the storm. Instead, we can choose to mourn, to lament, to surrender, to surrender our struggle to control what we can't control, to, sur to surrender the weight that we can't carry on our own, to acknowledge our poverty of spirit that Becca talked about last week. When mourning brings us there, when we can admit our need for God, when we can see that we may not be able to affect change in our situation, but maybe God wants to affect change in us, then in our mourning, we find comfort. We find rest from our struggle, a release of the tight grip we've been holding on our pain, we find the hand of God slipping into our own. I will never leave you nor forsake you, he says. So many in the crowd were mourning in just this way. They thought they were on the outside of God's kingdom looking in, but Jesus says, no, you're right here in the arms of the Father. Don't let the world tell you differently. This is who God is. Blessed are the those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And then there is the loss caused by our own sin. That spiritual exile that cuts us off from the source of life by our own doing. Pride and fear and jealousy and greed, they scar our relationships and they mar the world and keep us from living out of the abundance that God promises. We keep getting in our own way over and over again, and we hurt others along the way. And most importantly, we grieve the heart of God. Until we mourn our own sinfulness, until we come to grips with our own stubbornness and blindness and fear, it will be very difficult for us to understand the way of Jesus in the Beatitudes. To love the world as Jesus calls us to. It is for the world that Jesus died. For those we don't understand. For those we do not like. For those we completely overlook. For all of us. Jesus had compassion. The word literally means to suffer with. He suffered with us as he was among us. And then he suffered for us as he gave up his life. He flipped the script on everything we think we know about love and life and what it means to be blessed. That's where the Pharisees found themselves left out of the blessings that Jesus pronounced. They were neither poor in spirit but rather steeped in their own pride, nor did they mourn for the world. They disdained the world. They separated themselves from the world. But Jesus came to love the world, the whole world. What will it take to surrender ourselves, to pray with Jesus, not my will, God, but thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Barbara Brown Taylor tells the story of the death of her father. He had a seizure a few weeks before Christmas and the family gathered around his hospital bed. Though he was weak, he knew who they were as she and her sisters tended to him, wetting his dry lips with that little pink hospital sponge, kissing him on his forehead and reminding him how loved and beloved he was. At one point, Taylor's husband, Ed, went over and whispered something in her father's ear. Then, kneeling down on the floor next to the bed, Ed fit his head under her father's bony hand. And reaching up, he put his own hand on top of it to make sure that it didn't slip off of his head. And then he held still while her father's lips moved. After he stood up, he leaned over and said something else in her father's ear. I asked him to bless me, he told her later. In your mourning, feel the gentle weight of the father's hand on you and hear him bless you and say, you are mine. Be comforted. Be a comforter. Be a conduit of God's blessing. Love one another. Bear one another's burdens. Discover the holy ground of God's presence in us and among us. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Amen.